Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Today, I am joined by Oscar Trimboli, because we said we'd be in Italian or Trimboli. Uh, and he is a deep listener. His newest book, How to Listen, fresh off the press. Oscar, how are you today? G'day, Anthony. Really looking forward to listening to your questions. Uh, our, our morning started off really well after lots of floods in our part of the world. The sunshine came out today, so uh, we're optimistic. Okay, well, I'm glad everybody is safe and, and hopefully everything goes great. Uh, I'm excited to chat with you. I appreciate what you had sent off around deep listening, impact beyond words. And what I thought was cool was different ways on how to improve your listening, how to work on the listening. And then as we chatted in our pre-interview, you asked me a very thoughtful question about how I listen, uh, but before we get into listening and talking about what you do, why don't you give a little introduction about who you are uh, to our listeners so they can understand a bit about your background and uh, your accomplishments so far. Yeah, along with the Deep Listening Ambassador community, we're on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the workplace. And we kind of trace that back to 2008 when I was in a boardroom. Uh, doing a video conference between Sydney, Seattle and Singapore was the annual budget setting process for Microsoft. And uh, it was supposed to go for 90 minutes, I actually finished early. And at the 20 minute mark, my vice president looked me straight in the eye and said, Oscar, I need to see you immediately after this meeting. Now, I don't know about you, Anthony, but when your boss says that, the only thing going through my head is how many weeks of salary have I got left in my bank account? I'm absolutely certain I'm going to get fired. Uh, there was lots of conversation. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the meeting finished early, which is unusual because this meeting is renowned for going for three hours. 70 minutes, everybody had finished. Good outcome for everybody except for Oscar. Tracy asked me to close the door. And as I walked back to sit next to her, she said, you have no idea what you did at the 20-minute mark, do you? And I thought, wow, I'm getting fired and I don't even know what I did. She said to me, if you could code how you listen, you could change the world. And as profound a moment of insight and listening as that was, Anthony, the only thing going through my head was, woohoo, I haven't been fired. And uh, since then, we've, we've been on a quest to code how to listening, the listening quiz, which will help you understand what your primary listening barrier is, is one of the ways we've coded that into a questionnaire into software at listeningquiz.com, the books, the playing cards, the jigsaw puzzles, the Apple award-winning podcast. These are all the things that we have in place, uh, along with the Deep Listening Ambassador community, a group of like-minded workplace listening professionals who are out there just trying to improve listening in their workplace by role modeling it rather than teaching it. So I'm curious, Anthony, what you're taking from that story. Uh, of course, I want to know what you said at the 20 minute mark. Um, I'm also curious as to how the world thinks about communication and you've uh, put things together uh, towards listening. And so um, those are the two things that are on my mind. Okay. Well, what was interesting is uh, I've probably done over 300 of these interviews, Anthony, and only three guests, uh, hosts have actually asked me the second question. What did I say at the 20 minute mark? So kudos to you for listening. And uh, I think one of the things that differentiates good listeners from great listeners, good listeners listen to what's said and great listeners listen to what's not said. And we'll talk a bit about the neuroscience of that. At the 20 minute mark, there was a lot of argument and debate going on about numbers, 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 growth numbers, percentage increase, a whole bunch of very intense debate. Now, I asked the room to pause and declare their assumptions before they announce their numbers. Hmm. In doing that, the group very quickly understood the context that sat behind the numbers by announcing their assumptions. Most of us, Anthony aren't even conscious that we use assumptions in there. Uh, if you're listening for assumptions, a couple of code words to listen for are generally framed as absolutes. They're phrases like always, never, precisely, exactly. When you start to hear these code words coming out in a dialogue in a team meeting over a Zoom, 
it's it's a cue for you it's a signpost to say ah let's let's expand that let's unpack that what's that assumption really all about but because many of us don't know the neuroscience of listening we just keep having the dialogue and we get into this heated debate about 14 percent of what the other person's thinking anthony let me give me three numbers and when you understand these three numbers about the neuroscience of listening, you'll understand why it's important to pause, maybe ask a few more questions. 125, 400, 900. These three numbers explain the words per minute at which we can speak on average. So the average speaking speed, 125 to 150 words per minute. A horse race caller, uh, they'll be speaking at about 200 words per minute, and you can completely understand what they're saying at 200 words per minute. And we know blind people can listen at up to 350 words per minute and have complete comprehension. 400 words per minute, that's your listening speed. Right now, you may be listening to this podcast or watching on YouTube at two times speed, and you can still understand exactly what I'm saying. You can listen even faster if you know the accent and you know the context of the conversation. So uh, you may be unfamiliar with jargon and the jargon pops up, so you might have to slow it down at that point. 125 speaking speed, 400 words per minute, your listening speed, you can listen faster than I can speak, therefore you're distracted. In fact, you're probably exercising right now, you may be commuting right now, you may be preparing a meal right now, but you can still understand what's going on. 900 words per minute, on average, a person's thinking speed. Now, if you're working complex, collaborative, creative, or resource-constrained environments or environments with conflict, you may be thinking up to 1,600 words per minute. Now, Anthony, if you can speak at only 125 to 150 words per minute, yeah, you can think at 900, it means that if you just listen to the very first thing somebody says, you're listening to 14% of what they actually think and more importantly mean. So my invitation to everybody is to do what Anthony did, which is listen for what wasn't said, listen for those extra 125 words rather than listening only to what's said. As I mentioned earlier, good listeners listen to what's said and great listeners notice what's not said. Anthony was furiously writing down all those numbers if you're listening on the podcast. I'm curious what you're taking away from the numbers, Anthony. Uh, I just wanted to, at least how I listen, is to make a mind map so that if I have to synthesize 10 or 15 minutes of information, which hmm. I can't do the math with me right now, uh, but I was just trying to make sure that if there was something relevant and important about that, that I missed it. But really, I didn't even write anything next to it. It's just so I have those kind of mile markers in terms of where I was at and what you were saying. So I didn't lose it if it was contextually relevant. Yeah. And uh, when we interviewed world memory champion, can you believe there's world memory Olympics, Anthony? Like globally, they get together and they shuffle cards and uh, line them up and they have to put the cards away and then they have to recite them in order. So world memory champion Boris Conrad would say, when it comes to note taking and listening, be sparing as you are, Anthony. Capture the concepts, don't capture verbatim. If you're looking to capture a full sentence, the minute you move into writing or typing mode, the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex that deals with the auditory pathways literally shuts down. So your ability to listen while you're taking notes is reduced. So you doing it lightly, think of it like salt or pepper on a meal rather than the main thing is a lovely, elegant way to take notes. And, and a wonderful hack that Boris taught us was when you have to take something verbatim, pause the speaker and just say, look, what you said is really important and I want to take a note on that. And it does two things. It gives you the time and the space to capture what was said that was important. And number two, it signals to the speaker that you're listening. What they said has got gravity and you're going to do something with it. Good listeners understand what's said. Great listeners change the way the speaker communicates. 
And simple techniques like note taking are ways of doing that. So when it comes to note taking, be sparing there as well. Anthony, when you hear 900 and 125 and only 14% of what I say the very first time is what I might be thinking and meaning, how does that show up in team meetings and conversations that you participate in? I think that often people, what, what I, I take a step back, when you're talking about writing and speaking is where I see teams get lost is when there's more than one conversation at once and intellectually you can hear it, but it doesn't create the group conversation that we want to have like when facilitating. Um, and then in terms of that, I find most people, not everybody, are just waiting to speak before they actually listen fully. Um, and then the other kind of gap I see in team meetings is uh, somewhat on the assumption piece is the difference between the words and then the context and then the intention, like the commitment behind what they say and what they're trying to say. So how you communicate very intentionally and no doubt you have information that you want, but you have a, hey, I want you to really make sure you understand this. And then also I want to be able to contribute to you as a human being to be a listener, a better listener in your space. So all of those things come through as you share the 125, 400, 900, because the information itself is one piece, but how you use it, how you understand it and where it actually hits you in your brain is another. So I think the gap is where people really apply and interpret the information. And so being able to have it concisely facilitated, written out on a paper, so that even if those conversations were there, you have the key takeaways on a board. Yeah. And if you're a leader who hosts a meeting, and even if you're not, keep in mind, listening happens before, during, and after the meeting. A lot of people say to me, Oscar, how do you listen after the meeting? Well, if you've ever been in a meeting where somebody committed to do something and they didn't, that's a really big signal that they weren't actually listening. Before the meeting though, and back to your point, Anthony, how do you get the meeting set up and create a culture where listening is not just present between the active speaker and the group, but that the group is listening to each other. If you're the host of that meeting, ask the group before the meeting commences, this could be prior to them gathering physically or virtually, or it could be at the commencement of the meeting, go around the room and ask everybody in one sentence, what would make this a great meeting for you? This prevents people running down rabbit warrens having their favorite piece of information that they want to share. Maybe, maybe they're repeating an old story because you can now use that information that you get back from the group to create a compass setting for the meeting as a host and for the rest of the group as well. It's very important that the rest of the group hears what the other people want to get out of the meeting. This simple hack Based on our deep listening research, 1,410 workplace leaders that we've been tracking for three years and four months now reduces their meetings by 15% consistently because people are talking about what they mean, not only what they say, and the rest of the group is listening to each other, not just the host or the active speaker of the conversation. It's a really simple, practical thing to do. When it comes to listening, though, uh, there's five levels of listening. Listening to yourself, number one. Listening to content, number two. Listening for context, number three. Listening for the unsaid, number four. And then finally, listening for meaning. What are they thinking and what are they meaning? And I'm often reminded, Anthony, of this story of Jennifer. Her son had come home from, from school. And he was a youngster and he skipped in the door and said to his mum, mummy, mummy, I'm so excited. I learned the three is half of eight today at math. And Jennifer is a former primary school teacher. She thought she misheard him. And she said, could you say that again, honey? And he said, yeah, we learn maths. We learn three is half of eight. And he was very enthusiastic, very energetic, very excited. But his mum wasn't. As a former primary school teacher, she put her hand in her face and thought, what are they teaching kids at school today? So she went to the cupboard and got 
eight M&Ms out, laid them out on the kitchen bench, four by four, all like little chocolate soldiers facing each other. And she picked her son up, Christopher, and put him on the bench. And she said, Christopher, can you count how many chocolate soldiers in this row? And he went, one, two, three, four, mummy. And how many on the other side? He didn't count them. He just said, they're all facing each other. So four, mummy. And she said, see, Christopher, four, not three, is half of eight. And with that, Christopher leapt off the table, went to the cupboard, got a piece of paper, <laughs> and he got a Sharpie or a texter, and he drew the figure eight on a piece of paper like this. And he, he folded the piece of paper in half vertically, and then he tore it in half for his mummy. And he said, see, mummy, he said three is half of eight. And in that moment, Jennifer realized that he was talking about geometry and she was talking about arithmetic. And yet, if you fold that piece of paper in half horizontally, zero is also half of eight. Now, we are in a lot of workplace conversations where we believe based on our traditions, our culture, our training, our profession, our experience, that the only correct answer is three to three being half of eight is wrong. Four is half of eight everywhere. And a lot of you are in conversations because you're listening to what people say, not what they mean. And when you listen to what they mean, the possibilities can open up because we discover that zero is half of eight, three is half of eight, four is half of eight. And I'm sure there's many other possibilities as well. Often when I do that presentation live, you can see the light globes go on at different speeds in the room. And there was a moment that Anthony realized and he literally drew the figure eight with his finger in the air where the conversation was going. And Anthony, in that moment, what was going through your mind as you drew the figure eight with your finger in the air? Well, I was doing the, yeah, the the three. Uh, I don't know. I think I think I just, I mean, I want to say like jumped ahead and be like, oh, I get it. I, I got the the aha moment of, you know, where the the gap was in communication and saying, okay, like, obviously I understand. I understand. And to that person, it was clear, but yeah, understood that. Have and then you, I was like, have, oh, have you, you had a, yeah. have you had a three is half of eight moment in, in your workplace conversations? Oh, I'm sure that I have uh, every time <laughs> uh, in my, with one of my colleagues who said, well, we said this, remember before we said this, and that happens a lot where we say, oh yeah, we, well, we agreed to do it this time. And I say, well, yeah, but maybe the circumstances are different or maybe I remember it to be this way. I do not remember it that way. And so sometimes I'm on the losing end of those conversations as in I don't have the memory for it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm sure it happens all the time. And I was just for lunch with a friend and we were talking about uh, he runs a family business, and so he's in his business in a business with his dad and his brothers. And uh, you know, I can only imagine we were talking about you know what, how are they seeing things versus how are you seeing things, and you know, don't make them wrong for it being a three where you say it must be a four because you both lose uh, in that if it has to be one way versus being able to take the other person's perspective. And I think that's a key part of alignment. So. Yeah. And if you want three practical questions you can ask to discover if you're having a three is half of eight moment, to listen for what's not said, to hear the extra 125 words. When you use these three questions, the speaker will change their body posture. Their eyes will move differently. Their head will tilt. They'll probably take it a breath in because you realize that you're impacting the way they're communicating and the way they're thinking about expressing the idea. By the way, questions with more than eight words are biased. Now, biased questions are not right or wrong. Just be conscious if by design you're trying to ask a biased question. And a, and a biased question can be used effectively when you're trying to prioritize, for example. Uh, we don't have infinite resources and you want to prioritize, you want to maybe want to do a stack ranking, uh, that would be a good time to use a bias question. So these questions are really short and they'll be easy to remember. These three questions will change the way you communicate. They will shorten meetings for you and more importantly, allow the speaker to express what they mean, not just what they think, 
not just what they say, but what they actually mean. The first one, tell me more. Just three words, tell me more. Some people shorten it and just say, say more. Question number one, tell me more. Question number two, and what else? Or some people shorten that to simply say, and? Notice all the questions are three words so far, so they're gonna be pretty easy to remember. Tell me more and what else? The last one, the most powerful, the most impactful, done well, it's liberating, done poorly, it's intimidating. So use this question with care. Use this to support your curiosity. Use this to liberate the thinking of the speaker. And here it is. Now it's no coincidence that the words silent and listen share the identical letters. And in a lot of high context cultures, and a lot of ancient cultures, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, the Inuit of North America, the jungle tribes of South America, the Maori and Polynesian cultures of the Pacific, and the Australian Indigenous communities all use silence as a way to bring tribes together to commence the meeting. I think in the West, we have an odd relationship with silence. We call it the awkward pause, the pregnant pause, the deafening silence. All of those adjectives are interesting descriptors, but pausing will be a great magnet to help extract what the person really means rather than only what they're saying. Do you have a favorite out of those three, Anthony? Uh, I like that. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me more? Or can you expand on that? So a variation of the first one. I haven't mastered the third one. Uh, and and is I use when I think that there is something else that is unsaid, um, but I don't usually use it on its own. Yeah. I zoom into 2015. It's November. I'm hosting an annual planning meeting for a company and its leadership team in a very dusty boardroom. And there are 12 people on the leadership team and lunch is due at 1 p.m. At uh, 12.35, the CEO looks at me, taps on the table, points to his watch, which is, I guess, my reminder that we're getting close to feeding time and he's hungry. We'd started an exercise, Anthony, which is describe this organization as an animal. And, and the reason we're doing this is to understand what people really mean, not just what the animal is. Now, this company was operating in the technology sector and had experienced strong growth. They were growing at 30% per annum, which in a lot of industries would be phenomenal, but their competitors were growing at 300% per annum and the CEO was really worried. So I was brought in to ask people to reset their thinking about how ambitious they should be. And as we went around the table from 12.35 all the way up to 12.58, everybody had described a bird of prey, an eagle, an osprey, something that moved fast like a cheetah or a leopard. And we had just one person to go the quietest person in the room, the finance person in the room. And it's time for lunch. And the CEO, if he was a comic book hero, Anthony, I think he would have laser beams exploding my head because he was really, really hungry. And by now the food was on the table. So all the smells were there. And I think he was very getting very frustrated with me, wanting me to wrap up. At two minutes, to one, I turned to Lynn, who was to my right, who hadn't spoken. And I didn't say, hey, Lynn, you haven't spoken yet. It's time for lunch. Can you hurry up? I just turned to her very slightly and extended my arm out about halfway. And Lynn said, I thought it was obvious. 
I thought we were a snake. And with that, you could feel the tension in the room rising. And I extended my arm just a little further. I didn't make any eye contact, inviting her to expand. And she said, I thought we're a snake because we've forgotten to shed our skin each season. We have systems and processes that are holding our staff back and our customers back. We need to shed our skin every season. Now, what you don't know about Lynn Anthony, she was from a culture that a snake was a symbol of wisdom. In the West, a snake is considered, well, I'll ask you, Anthony, when I say a snake, what are some of the adjectives you might provide when it comes to a snake? Yeah, it just didn't seem uh, uh, as a positive thing. I wasn't sure if it would reference an individual or not. Yeah, so snakes are considered sneaky. Um, snakes are considered the villain in one of the original Christian and biblical stories. Um, the snake was the one that tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yet in Lin's culture, she was from China, uh, snakes were very wise. Um, snakes adapted, snakes adjusted to their conditions. Now, if we just would have ignored Lynn, um, the meeting wouldn't have done what it did next. There was a very, very, very visceral debate going on between snakes, leopards, cheetahs, ospreys, and eagles. And it went on till 1.35 and nobody touched their food, Anthony. Mm. And the point of the story is, are you listening to everybody in a meeting or you're only listening to the people who verbally process, they process their ideas by speaking, by thinking, whereas other people process thinking by listening. Well, when you do that, you can transform the business. The post story on that business is uh, they adopted the snake as a beanie toy inside their business. Uh, it became an award they gave out. It became a logo they used. It became code names for the products they developed. And they quickly overtook the 300% competitor that was growing by looking at international markets in a completely different way. When you listen beyond the words, you can shorten meetings, but you can increase the impact of what you do every day. And, and I guess that's why Anthony, me and the deep listening ambassadors are so passionate about the impact of listening. Don't get me wrong, speaking is important and speaking and listening need to coexist, but in a ratio closer to 50-50 rather than 90-10. Awesome. Well, Oscar, I really appreciate it. A very cool way and a different way to think about how teams can communicate, can work together. Um, obviously some very specific, practical and vivid examples as to what that could look like. So I appreciate you putting us there and um, just a takeaway to really understand and test assumptions and inferences how you work with your team. You'll get a richer communication. You'll have a deeper understanding and connectedness and you'll have a greater foundation um, to work from as you as you build a team. So Oscar, I really appreciate it. Uh, where can people connect with you? Where can they uh, pick up some of your work and where can they join your community? Look, rather than connecting with me, discover what gets in the way when it comes to your listening. My, my gift for you is the listening quiz at listeningquiz.com. If you go and visit there, you can get um, a very quick and simple report with very practical tips for you to apply tailored specifically to one of the four listening barriers that get in people's way. So listeningquiz.com, and that's the gateway to all the other things you asked about how to connect with me and the deep listening ambassador community as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Oscar. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your wisdom as we looked at that. And uh, I encourage everybody to embrace their snakiness as it relates to communication and listening, because maybe some of your listening structures no longer support you as you want to grow. And you'd be wise to shed those and let those go. So uh, thank you again, Oscar, for being our guest on the Strategy and Leadership Podcast today. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Folks, my name is Anthony Taylor. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Indeed, thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.